Hello and welcome back to Havoc. And when we left off, we had just taken Stenpunkt Castle and we are then beset upon by Izdenka's army. Now, I haven't taken a look at what her composition is at the moment, but I am going to assume that they have some pretty high tier units. This faction has been expanding quite considerably over the past couple of in-game weeks. At least, that's what I can tell. And hopefully, what I'm going to be able to do is defeat them, and then, well, I can't really do anything with them because I, I can't convince them to join me. They are the ruling faction. Well, should we say ruling clan in their faction? And yeah, that's not going to really make any difference. So let's take a look at the composition right? Okay, never mind. They have 162 recruits. Let's just straight go on in here. They cannot possibly win. I, I don't believe at least. I don't think they can win. But I mean, who knows? You know, I mean, <laughs> it's kind of a bit funny. I really say that quite often, which is, yeah, you know, it's it's not not great. Not great. I would have expected an army such as this, especially within a faction like this, to actually be fielding quite a, a, quite a significant amount of relatively mid to high tier troops. But that is not the case, apparently. They really don't have anything that we need to worry about. So, going to be kind of interesting to see how fast this actually is. It would be a re you know, it would actually be really, really amusing if I, if, if well, if we lose this. You know, if we lose this right now, which, in my opinion, cannot possibly happen, but if we lose this right now, considering I'm literally running into every single tree in the entire universe, not entirely sure how that's happening, but yes, okay, apparently I want to become a lumberjack. Yeah, apparently I want to become a lumberjack, because these trees, albeit uh, being um, extremely thin and probably not very good for, you know, gaining wood for any kind of resource, is, um, yeah, it's, they're, they're standing in my way quite often for some reason. Probably because I'm just so incredibly skilled and running into them, you know? That is generally what I tend to do. That is a skill of mine that I have worked upon and polished over the many, many years of playing the Mountain Blade franchise. And if you've seen any of my Warband content, which if you have, then props to you and very much appreciate it for your support over the years but the point is if you've seen that then you'll know that i generally tend to say hi to the, to the trees quite often um it's become a little bit better with bannerlord don't get me wrong i haven't really you know crashed into trees that often mostly because the horses are a little bit more maneuverable in bannerlord i'm not entirely sure if that's the case but it feels that way at least and Generally, they do tend to give you quite a few bonuses in regards to the maneuverability of the mounts in general. So it is a lot easier for you to control these things at high speed. And they're a lot more, shall we say, responsive. Because in Warband, the main difference with going on a horse is that the speed is so incredibly, mm, shall we say, uncontrolled... It's very, very difficult to, uh, well, rein it in before you crash into an obstacle of some kind. But it, it could also be, of course, that, you know, ba uh, well, Bannerlord is just more refined in, uh, in some ways, you know. And I mean, it may still be in development, but the hitboxes are obviously a little bit better when it comes to the trees themselves. Because in Warband, sometimes trees can look as though they're not really that large but then they're absolutely massive in terms of their hitbox, and you're going to just run into them. And other times, you can go straight through trees some of the time because they, they don't have any substance to them whatsoever, and they're just basically a, a, a sprite model, whatever you want to call it. Anyway, we're going to be letting these people go. Basically makes no difference whatsoever to me if I let them go or not. I actually should probably take them prisoner if I do come across the leader of the uh, of the faction which i think is isn't it um oh it's yorig oh i actually thought it was godun for some reason okay well never mind it is yorig so if we do come across yorig i will be taking him prisoner that makes the most sense to me because he's no doubt going to have the most money he'll probably have the most money he'll have the most mm, shall we say influence and various other things like that now 
Here's the thing, I'm gonna be very quickly scurrying back to the nearest town because I actually don't have a huge amount of food and I'm going to have to make, well, uh, make tracks pretty fast to be able to get back there before my food runs out. Actually, not, it's not too bad, actually. I was expecting us to have to run back there much, much quicker than I thought, but we had 10 days, but, well, 10 days is not really that much, right? You know, it's uh, it's quite a... Quite a small amount. Aha! Interesting. Did you see that message that just popped up right there? Oh yeah, that is exactly the kind of message we wanted to see. Okay, so that basically means that the town that, uh, that we were beaten to, shall we say, in one of the previous episodes, because I was standing there and then this guy just came swooping in and started the siege before I could do it. Obviously, that was just a case of you snooze, you lose, more likely. And I was the snoozing one in that case. But um, yes, anyway, point is, he has now had a rebellion on his hands, and he's lost control of it, which is absolutely fantastic. So really, really pleased to see that. And we're just going to buy absolutely everything that I can here. Now we have 27 days. That's much more respectable, in my opinion. And I think we already, yeah, we did already level up the majority of our units, at least. Okay, so this is the current situation. As you can see, there's the rebellion going on there. That's great. That means I can go down there at pretty much any time. And I can probably take some stuff. You know, I can probably take this and maybe Odok as well, because it feels to me like this is the only fief that they have. But bear in mind that I am actually spreading myself quite thinly here. I, I don't know whether you notice that, but we're kind of yeah, we're kind of doing the the tree thing on the battlefield that we were just on. In other words, we're super thin, aren't we? We're super thin and not so much wide. And in my opinion, that needs to be rectified. So I think the best thing that we can probably do, instead of continuing on through here, well, obviously we're going to deal with our current conflict. Of course. I mean, what else is there to do? But yeah, we're going to be taking Sibir, Van Overpol, and Tackle Castle. And then I'm probably going to be making my way back and then uh, causing war against these two factions, taking those two, and then spreading outward in a, um, shall we say, horizontal fashion rather than vertical this time around. So that would probably make the most sense. Hopefully, we are going to see the army led by Ilatar actually doing something rather useful. That, well, I mean, I say hopefully very filled with a lot of, well, hope, really. I mean, if I could, you know, double stuff hope into hopeful, then I would do that. Because unfortunately, I don't have a lot of, um, don't have a lot of faith in this guy actually being able to pull this off. Even though Ilatar, in my opinion, is obviously one of the best leaders that we have at the moment. I personally don't believe he's... Maybe he doesn't have enough influence? Uh, no, no, he's actually looking pretty good, as you can see right here. He's actually looking real good. So I don't need to give him any influence whatsoever. Maybe I do need to give him a little bit. I mean, I have 1,900 influence. I mean, I can, I can spare a little bit, right? So let me actually just give him a little bit. Let's just make sure that he can continue to run around as much as he wants. And then who else has, a, who else has an army? I think, who is it again? Who's, who's this? Oh, Attis. Attis has... Oh, that's interesting. Okay, I wasn't expecting him to have one, but there you go. Okay, we're going to be giving him a bunch as well because I want him to be able to continue running around. And if they run out of influence, well, they're not going to be able to. So, yeah, we definitely need to do that. We need to also give him another fief too. So if he does... Um, well, shall we say if Ilatar does actually take Sibir, then we're, of course, going to be doing something about providing... Attis with a fief. I'm going to leave Van Overpol right now, it appears. That is not something that I really want to do, actually. Wait a minute. Do you think I can... Uh -oh. oh, big mistake, sir. Big mistake. Did you see that? I can't believe he did that. Okay, this is, this is going to be real, real interesting. Okay, I... I actually feel like I can auto-resolve this, and, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to auto-resolve that. We're going to let them go once again. I'm probably going to take this guy because he was the leader of the army. I'm going to take him prisoner. And we're not going to be taking any of the other prisoners at all here. I do have a lot of people that are currently injured. So I'm going to just wait here for a little bit of time before we institute 
the next siege. Attis is actually coming over here. He's raiding all the villages. Now, here's the thing. Generally, I would actually say that raiding all these villages is a pretty good strategy, actually, all things considered. But the main problem with it is that I'm just about to take Van Overpol and then these villages will be unable to be recruited from, which, of course, is... Well, it's not great. Let's just say that. It's not, not the best idea. So, yeah, that's a little unfortunate. Where's the where's the fourth slot? Oh, there it is. It's hidden under the snow. That's interesting. Yes. Anyway, um, my forces are all back on their feet, which is actually real nice. And they have built ballistas. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Yes, I, I, have, I have said this time and time again. Personally, I feel like ballistas are really not very good for defending against trebuchets. They are supposed to be good. Don't get me wrong. They're supposed to be good. And I think that that's what the developers have intended. Because if you think about ballistas from a, uh, I don't know, logical perspective or whatever, they have a lot of accuracy, right? They have a lot of accuracy. They have a high damage per second. They're able to shoot very quickly, you know, all of that wonderful stuff. And they can also be constructed really fast too. So generally they have everything going for them with the exception of their low HP, of course. Now, however, that does not help them, of course. Being eliminated in one hit by a trebuchet, that is just absolutely awful for them. That is really, really bad. And they are highly unable to actually do anything in a defensive situation against trebuchets. I mean, look at them. They haven't destroyed any of my trebuchets so far. Oh, there we go. Speak of the devil. There we are. Fantastic. They were actually able to get one of our trebuchets down. But by this time, look at their walls. Look at the walls that they have currently going on. They have... No walls. Actually, they do have... Oh, okay. Can this one ballista? Yes, there we go. Okay. <laughs> I was actually complaining about the enemy's ballistas, and now all of a sudden they were able to take out all of my trebuchets. But that's absolutely fine, because it's too late. It's too late for them now. It is too late. They, their walls are done. They may still have some ballistas up and running, which, of course, is, well, a little bit bad. You know, it is a little bit bad for us. But... Apart from that, I mean, they really don't have a leg to stand on here. It's going to be very difficult for them. And that's exactly what I mean. I feel, I don't know, I feel like the trebuchets should probably be changed to be a wall only, you know, a wall only uh, piece of siege equipment. Because if that's the case, then you can just dedicate so much more to other things. But if they do that, and we've got to think about the other side here, if they make it, that the trebuchets are wall only then how is it actually going to work with destroying enemy siege equipment for example destroying those ballistas it's going to be impossible for you to destroy enemy ballistas because you yourself don't have any offense at all and because the construction speed is just so fast most of the time it's very difficult to make that work in my opinion so there's a whole host of reasons why that might be how did I get killed right there? Oh, I died from... Oh, okay. Someone actually shot me in the neck. If you see that, look at that. Someone shot me in the neck for 56 damage. That was the main reason why I died there. Because that guy hit me for only 3 damage. So, of course, I'm not going to take... Well, I, I'm not going to die from that. I'm not going to die from 3 blunt damage. But someone shot me in the neck. And so that was the reason. Okay. Well, that's good to know, it, I suppose. But, um, yeah. Anyway. Um, I suppose it's, it's not too bad. I think we're probably going to... Are we going to achieve victory? Are we actually going to get it? Are we going to get a victory? <laughs> I'm actually kind of wondering now. I'm not entirely sure. I think we will. Just purely because we have just such high tier units. But, you know, it looks a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit iffy here and there. Anyway, point is, it's a bit of a weird situation to be in for the developers. Because I, I myself am suggesting something... And then if you, but, but here's the thing, if you think about it from the other side, if you think about it from the perspective of, well, how are the players offensive, you know, siege destroying pieces of equipment, how are they supposed to actually survive long enough for them to destroy the enemy's ballistas and catapults? Because if the enemy's catapults and ballistas are focusing down your siege equipment, and let's say that they just ignore the trebuchets, you know, let's say they ignore the trebuchets. 
because obviously the trebuchets are just, you know, damaging the walls. So in that case, it's going to be a very difficult situation because they're going to be in a situation where the trebuchets are damaging the walls, but then the siege is just completely left alone. And if they have four, you know, four ballistas up and running and they're consistently bombarding your two trebuchets or one trebuchet, depending on how many you want to destroy the walls with, it's going to be kind of impossible, you know? It's going to be a... I don't know. It's going to be kind of difficult. So it's, uh, it's a difficult, difficult scenario to solve. And um, yeah, that's the thing, you know? I or anyone else can basically just just say something, you know. We can we can you know we can say that stuff. We can go, ah, oh, yeah, you know what would be really cool, and then giving your suggestion. But that's the point. The suggestion has to be balanced from a certain perspective, and I'm obviously not thinking of that sometimes. So some of my ideas, while they might be cool in theory, are definitely going to be difficult to implement in a balanced fashion. So while the system at the moment is obviously quite clearly maybe not what we want ideally from the finished product, of course, it's still going to be possibly better than the suggestion that I made just now. So it really makes a huge difference. Anyway, look at that. Yorick has been taken prisoner. That is real nice. I like that. Oh, yeah, that is that is looking real cool. And what we're going to do is we're just going to do this. I'm going to stop the construction on the marketplace and we're going to get the orchards up and running. It's going to take 15 days for that to happen, but I think that shouldn't be too bad, or at least I hope it shouldn't be too bad. Let's ransom our prisoners right here too. We should probably get a Sturgeon companion and make them a clan owner, possibly. Make them a clan, a clan leader. I'm actually not sure whether we should do that, to be honest, because if I think about that right now, it, it, it sounds it sounds kind of bad. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Anyway, let's just go to Van Overpol real fast, and we'll just get a little bit of recruitment going on here. I don't really care how many I put in there. I just want some some units in there. Just want some units just to be recruited relatively quickly. And hmm, maybe that's not even a good idea. You know, now that I think about it, maybe it's not a good idea because if you think about how much food the town has inside it already it's only got it's got zero <laughs> it's got zero it's got zero food so i'm not sure how it's supposed to recover from this it needs to have its villages be unassaulted for quite some time potentially so what i'm actually going to do is i will make my way out of here i will give van overpol like i said to my clan leader atis and oh apparently we want to declare war against someone okay this is interesting Okay, well, why would I want to declare war against this guy? He's all the way down in Azariah territory. This makes no sense whatsoever. I'm actually going to say no to this. Usually I would say yes. We've been at peace too long. Our men grow... Okay, I'm sorry to say, but we're actually at peace, sir. Yes, the AI is being a little bit weird again. Oh, uh, well, never mind. I'm going to say no to this. At least for the moment, okay? For the moment. I would very much like to, you know, make make war against another faction relatively soon, but... This faction right here is being really annoying. I should probably go and just execute this guy or something like that. I mean, he has 103 total combat strength. Maybe we can actually... Can we propose peace with him? Yeah. There we go. There we go. Okay, yeah. We had to, unfortunately, um, succumb to the war exhaustion problem. So we lost a bunch of influence as a result of this, which is obviously not exactly great. But, you know, we, uh, we, had, we have to do our best. You know, we have to do our best with, with what we are given. And um, someone actually mentioned in the comments that it is unfortunately not possible to make peace in that way as a faction leader. And I thought to myself, really? Is that actually the case? Because if that's actually the case, that is really, really harsh and kind of bad. So yeah, that's actually um, kind of shocking to me because I would have expected you to be able to make peace as a faction leader. I mean, you can't you know, speak to people and do it that way. You have to do it through the diplomacy screen, I guess. But that's also kind of that's also kind of frustrating. But yeah, as you can see, Ilatar was unfortunately not able to take Sibir, as I previously thought. Now, what we're going to do is before we go in here, I'm going to be granting. And where is it now? Van Overpol. There we go. Oh, I can't do this while I'm in a seat. Are you so tough to birth? Okay, fine, fine. I'm going to remain the owner of Van Overpol for now, and then I will give the fief to Atis. 
after this. This is obviously uh, far from ideal because I already have one trebuchet up and running. If I'd, if, yeah, ah, nah, well, never mind. If I'd done it beforehand, before starting the siege, that, that would have been nice, but oh well. It's fine. It's fine. I mean, hopefully it's not going to be besieged because if it does get besieged, hopefully my, my forces are going to be able to defend it and they're not going to just completely ignore the fact that it needs help. Because some of the time, if you don't give the AI ownership over a place, they do tend to ignore it. Sometimes. And other times, not. Other times, they're really on the ball and they're making us proud. But, uh, yeah, it can, it can vary, you know. It can vary quite dramatically in their performance. But, yeah, look at the catapults. They, oh, are they being destroyed in one hit? actually not sure whether two trebuchets are hitting it at one time or whether it's it literally okay here's the thing this is a really really good um well should i say it's a really good uh here i go again eh with my quote-unquote cool ideas i mean who knows it's probably a bad idea let's face it it's me right but what i was gonna say is maybe we could make it so that I mean, not we, but maybe the developers could make it so that the catapults actually have um, the ability, at least, to survive two hits from a trebuchet rather than just one. I'm not sure whether that's actually the case already. I was just seeing that the catapults were being destroyed very fast. So that's the thing. I don't know whether that is the case because it has been some time since I have used one trebuchet alone and actually seen how much damage it has been capable of but just mentioning that basically says hey you know what maybe that is actually a good solution to make because that means that the AI if they don't build ballistas and they build catapults they might actually have a pretty decent shot of surviving or at, at the very least defeating your trebuchets before the walls have been destroyed although that previous siege that we had at Van Overpol, uh, they almost succeeded. You know, they actually almost succeeded. They did destroy a couple of um, a couple of my trebuchets, and they were almost able to fight us off. But obviously, well, they were, of course, unable to eventually. But there's not much we can do about that. Anyway, so yeah, let's just try and slaughter as many of these wonderful friends that we have here as much as we can. And then we will be taking... Well, I mean, look, literally, look at the amount of... The amount of bloodshed that has been wrought on the populace already. It's actually kind of crazy. Yeah, that, that that's... that. This has to be probably one of the easiest sieges we've had. It's probably because Ilotar went in here, dealt with a lot of the high-tier units, and then the only forces that these fellows had in here were militia. Were militia units, and we know how easy militia units can be, so... That was a super easy victory, probably one of the easiest we've had in recent memory, and we didn't even get to uh, go into the keep. They literally did not even survive. They didn't have enough, well, enough troops uh, run away. And they have a massive amount of troops that I can rescue too, which is fantastic. That is actually super good. That means that uh, maybe Ilatar lost some people, and um yeah now i'm going to be placing all of these in the garrison there you go boom look at that 263 in the garrison already that means i don't have to set up anything i don't have to set up anything at all i can basically just leave these in here i don't have to set up improved garrison or anything but i am going to be placing a whole bunch of money in here that makes the most sense in the world to me and we are going to just queue up a bunch of buildings. I'm sure they're going to be cancelling these if they want to, but yeah. Otherwise, we're going to be giving Sibir, not Van Overpol now, but we're going to be giving Sibir to, um, to Attis. So that's what we're going to do. There we go. Let's do that. There we are. Okay, fantastic. So now he has ownership over this. This is going to be very difficult for anyone to take now because they, I mean, it has 263 defenders in there. That's pretty significant for right off the bat. I mean, Van Overpol by, um, by comparison has 147. So yeah, it's quite a significant difference. And otherwise, we only have one extra fief to take before we should really go back, you know, withdraw our forces and try to consolidate our territory once more. We've tried to consolidate many, many times over the course of this series so far, and it seems to actually be working quite nicely. Um, but I feel like we have definitely overextended ourselves in this case. I'm actually going to auto-resolve here. Uh, I'm just going to let these guys go now because you never know. Maybe we're going to be able to 
persuade Yorick to join us at some point if he ever doesn't become the leader of his faction. I mean, if he's ever not the leader of a faction, potentially. I'm not entirely sure whether that even happens in this, because I've seen a number of times in the past in series where the leader, the ruler of a faction, I've seen it with uh, Regea and Lucon specifically, they have left their factions when they've been completely eliminated or deserted by the rest of their, their vassals. And, um, yeah, then, of course, someone can swoop in there or, or you know, they can be persuaded to, uh, to join their faction. So hopefully that's going to work for us, too, maybe at some point. I mean, I would like that very much because they're super, super powerful clans. You know, they're all tier six and everything. So that's going to be real nice if that actually does happen. And now we're going to get the ability to uh, resolve the peerage policy. Oh, OK. Yeah, this is actually kind of harsh. Okay, um, can I can I say no to this? Mm, can, can I say no to this? Because here's the thing. I, I really do not like peerage whatsoever. Um, not because I don't trust my vassals. <laughs> Far from it. Mm -hmm. No, no. It's mostly because the AI can make some really weird decisions. And if peerage comes into effect, those decisions can just go through if I don't have the influence capable of, of uh, saying no to it. So I'm going to say no to this for now, because thankfully I actually can do that. It's going to cost me 60 influence, but obviously that's not really that much. Um, but if, if it had gone through, it would have cost me 120 influence to say no to that. And that was a very minor vote. But if there are more and more vassals piling on to a particular decision, yeah, it's going to be very, very dangerous for us to allow that to go through because then they're just going to declare war against anyone they want. They're going to make peace against anyone they want and we are going to have no control whatsoever over what's going on. Now, wait a minute. What's actually going on here? Did he, did he actually bombard the walls? No, he didn't. Oh, I am an imbecile. Oh, yes, I am an imbecile. I thought there was a reason why I was waiting outside there. Oh, well, never mind. I, I think it should be fine. You know, it's one of those times where we're going to have to do a little bit of the dirty work. In other words, let's get the ladder and do a little bit of physicality. Yes, our bulging muscles are lifting up this piece of heavy wood. <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. Anyway, let me get out my bow real, real quick and try and shoot a bunch of these guys. Make sure that they, uh, well, it cannot shoot me in the neck, shall we say. I'm shooting that rock. Do you do you notice that? There's actually a rock right there. Oh, and I can't actually hit that guy. Okay, yeah, never mind. I'm at the wrong angle, as you can quite clearly tell. Because shooting to the right apparently is impossible. Ah, uh, yes. Okay, so this is the one time where I literally just cringe every single time I try to hit someone, and they beat me with a blacksmithing hammer. Yes. Ah. Uh. You know, it's one of those times where you think, oh, yeah, I've got, I've got the, I don't know, the legendary Sword of Souls, and I cannot possibly be beaten in Mortal Kombat. And then all of a sudden, a guy with a smithing hammer comes up to you and is like, oh, but I have a faster attack speed, even though I only do seven damage. Every single time I hit you. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm talking about, you know. It's, it's those kinds of situations where I just think to myself, why? <laughs> uh, that, uh, that's actually one of the reasons why I personally feel like a... Um, like a... You know, you know how in Dark Souls, right? The Dark Souls series of games, games uh, Demon Souls, Dark Souls, um, Elden Ring, uh, all of those games, you know, all of the From Software games, they all have a, an attribute called poise, right? And for me, I feel like it would be really cool if Bannerlord had a similar system and i'm not talking about making it exactly like you know exactly like dark souls here because generally um all i'm saying is depending on what kind of armor you wear and well yeah probably armor right because it, it makes the most sense for it to be armor yeah so yeah depending on what kind of armor you wear you gain a certain amount of poise or well let's not call it poise but let's call it something like i don't know resilience potentially so let's call it something like Resilience, but it does essentially the same thing as Poise from the Dark Souls games. In other words, when you get hit, 
you have a chance, dependent on your poise, <laughs> dependent on your resilience rating, <laughs> if we call it that, to ignore the damage. And I'm not talking about ignoring the damage as a as a damage value. I'm talking about oh, I can't jump on that roof. I am sad panda. Oh well, never mind. Yes. Anyway, so to ignore the damage. In other words, to ignore the interruption of your attack because you're wearing heavy armor. Obviously, this is very much an uh, well. Let's just say it's unrealistic. You know, it, it's kind of unrealistic because let's face it, if you get attacked. In a real situation, and you get and you get hit by a by a smithing hammer, even even a smithing hammer, it's still going to do damage to you, and you're still going to feel the hit, so to speak. But because this is partially an RPG, I felt like, hey, you know what? Maybe if I'm wearing super good armor, maybe I don't feel it as much. You know, maybe I don't feel it as much. Maybe I'm able to. You know, just hit through that because with a with a long a long long ish pole arm, you know, it's kind of it's kind of long, right? I feel like I'm I would like to not be beaten consistently by units that have smithing hammers or hunting axes or something along those lines. But I suppose that is the main reason why they are actually using those weapons because they are much better in close quarters combat. And yes, I I agree. You know. It should definitely be a case where there are alternate weapon selections and weapon choices that are as viable as the next one. Because you obviously don't want to be in a situation where one weapon is overall better than everything else. Of course, I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying that I feel like if you're wearing some pretty heavy armor, maybe it would make sense in an RPG fashion to give yourself a little bit of resilience in that respect. But obviously, yeah. Maybe it, maybe it doesn't matter, you know, maybe it doesn't matter at all. And maybe I'm just spousing off about nothing. But I feel like that could be a pretty cool thing. But I don't know, maybe there's a downside to it that I'm not thinking of right now. I mean, personally, for me, I'm not really someone that cares that much about realism. But if you are someone that does, then I can definitely see why you may not really like that. But, oh well, never mind. Maybe you can disable it. I don't know. Maybe there's an option to disable it in the menus or something like that if, if they actually do implement a system like it, which I highly doubt. Maybe a mod. Maybe there's a mod out there that does it. So if you really, really want that kind of thing, then you can definitely do it through that. Anyway, we have finally been able to rid the world of Ormidoving. And we're going to be proposing peace straight away and boom, just getting them out, out of there. I don't, I don't want to fight them anymore. They can just go away and hopefully not bother us. <laughs> uh, yes, exactly. That's exactly what, what people think. Anyway, we are in the next couple of episodes probably going to be heading over here. We'll take these two. Maybe, maybe I'll take them off screen. Do you think I should take them off screen? Maybe I'll take them off screen. I don't know. I might take them off screen and then we might wage war against this somewhat large faction. Who is this? Yeah, I, I don't know who this is. This is someone that we've not fought before, but we could also do something with the Naretzes clan as well. We do have some pretty good connections over there. So I'm actually wondering, maybe we can make an alliance with them. I highly doubt an alliance is going to be any bit viable. I'm going to check just now, just to see. Mm, no, this faction is not interested in an aggression pact with you. That's kind of surprising considering they're at war against so many people. They have decent strength. Look at that. They're actually doing pretty well, surprisingly enough. But there you go. Anyway, yeah, so we might be fighting against our old, um, our old clan as well. And otherwise, I thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.